Welcome to the NISL course on conservation planning for climate change. In this first chapter, we'll be looking at the evidence for anthropogenic climate change, that is, how do we know that the climate is changing around us? Weather and climate affect all manner of human and natural interactions. Weather is the day-to-day -day effects of natural conditions, but climate refers to an averaging of the mean of these effects over a time period, usually annual or multi-year, although climatic regions may be defined by the seasonality of effects, such as the winter rainfall region of the Cape. Both systems are naturally variable. Climate is known to vary year on year, or even over decades. It is influenced on varying timescales by factors such as changes in the sun's output, the Earth's orbit, changes in the gaseous composition of the Earth's atmosphere, and changes in the makeup of the Earth's surface, for in instance vegetation cover. These relatively short-term changes are termed climate variability, or climate variation. When the average and extreme events betray a long-term transformation in overall climatic conditions, it is termed climate change. The Earth has experienced considerable change in climatic conditions due to natural variations in the solar cycle, the composition of the atmosphere, and even orogeny, which is the development of new surface features and transformation of ocean, ocean basins through geological processes. In recent history, the human race has experienced climate change. The most recent ice age ended about 10,000 years ago, and today we're experiencing a relative climatic optimum. It is telling that although biologically modern humans have been around for more than 150,000 years, human civilization and agriculture only occurred once the Earth warmed to the current levels. Changing climatic variables could be expressed in different ways, depending on how the climate is transformed. A change in mean temperature, for instance, would mean we would see more extreme heat and more hot weather events, as shown on the right of the first graph. It would also be accompanied by a gradual decrease in cool weather. A transformation in variance of temperature, on the other hand, would give a broader spread, resulting in more extremes of both heat and cold. If there were a change in both mean and variance of temperature, Whilst we would see more extreme heat and more warm weather, we might still observe extremes of cold weather. This type of change might therefore hide the changing signal, since certain regions of the planet would be unaffected. Only after extensive observation over a long period would the trend become clear. Although we are clearly detecting change in several of Earth's systems at the moment, evidence for change in others is inconclusive, and it may be as a result of this change in both means and their variations. Instrumental measurement of climate variables is an important data source, although we only have true records for a very short historical period. Using standard instruments, we record temperature, rainfall, wind, humidity, and atmospheric aerosol and gas concentrations. These standard variables allow measurement of change in Earth systems. Each of these sets of measurements portrays an important part of the Earth's climatic system, especially in terms of interactions with the biosphere. However, possibly the most useful of these measurements is temperature. Temperature is an essential indicator variable because it provides us with a direct measurement of the energy in the Earth's atmospheric system. Historical temperature records date from the middle of the 19th century when people first started using thermometers to measure air temperature. Surface air temperature is still usually measured at weather stations by means of mercury or alcohol thermometers. However, much recent work has been done to allow measurement of the temperature of other atmospheric levels, all the way up to the thermosphere, and this is using the Tyros N series of satellites. There are now two methods of measuring temperatures at different altitudes, the conventional radiosonde network and the microwave sounding unit, MSU, on the Tyros N satellites. The conventional network extends back to 1958, as described in ANGEL, and the MSU data back to 1979, detailed by Spencer and Christie in 1990. These satellites are also gradually being replaced by more modern satellites with more comprehensive monitoring equipment. In order to obtain data prior to the advent of modern measuring devices, climatologists resort to using proxy data from a variety of sources. These sources may include glaciological data in the form of ice cores. Scientists measure the oxygen isotopic content of ice cores, along with trace elements and microparticle concentrations, and even the physical properties of the ice itself. Geological data sources provide information over a much longer time period, and may include sediments of both marine and terrestrial origin. Sedimentary rocks provide data over a longer time period still, 
and scientists subject them to fasces analysis, fossil and microfossil analysis, mineral analysis, and isotopic geochemistry analysis. Biological data is only useful over a much shorter time period. Sources of biological data include tree rings, also known as dendroclimatology, pollen species and abundances, and insects. Historical records can be complicated because they are often not recorded in a systematic manner. Historical meteorological records are systematic. However, parameteorological records such as environmental indicators are not. Another source of historical data is phenological records or biological indicators. Paleoclimatological proxy data provides us with useful information but over very differing time periods. Looking at the data from the most recent to the longest time periods, we can see that historical data cannot give us useful information much beyond several thousand years. Tree rings and pollen, however, provide data up to several tens of thousands of years, and some ice cores show records up to a million years old. Ancient glacial deposits can have been laid down by glacial movements in the tens of millions of years ago, and marine organic and inorganic sediments provide data up to several hundred million years ago. Furthermore, some sedimentary rocks were laid down several billion years ago, but it is important to note that the resolution, and to some extent the accuracy of these data, decreases as we look further back in time. Data from ice cores is extracted in a number of ways. Oxygen isotopic analysis is carried out with a mass spectrograph, and it gives an idea of the temperature at which the ice was deposited. O18, or the heavier isotope of oxygen, has a higher vapor pressure and is therefore preferentially deposited. Thus, as water vapor travels towards the poles, water containing this heavier isotope will be deposited as water ice earlier, and the polar fraction has a lower percentage of O18. In warmer conditions, therefore, more O18 will be found in the polar ice than during cool temperatures. Atmospheric gas concentrations can also be extracted from bubbles formed by the closing off of air pores as fern turns to ice. Physical variations in ice structure also give us an idea of temperature, especially crystal size, the incidence of melts, and the number and structure of bubbles. The pattern of growth of trees is laid down within their structure, providing a high-resolution annual picture of climatic variables in the Holocene, which is the most recent geological time period. Much can be deduced from these growth bands. The thickness corresponds to the favorability of climatic conditions, such as light, temperature, and the rainfall and wind speed that the tree was subjected to. The density of the band says much about the length of the growing season, since late wood is generally much denser than early wood. Isotopic analysis of the bands can also give us information, in a similar manner to that of ice cores. Furthermore, by studying a number of trees in an area of a similar age, a statistically sound analysis of conditions can be obtained. Oceanic sediments provide us with another source of proxy information. Calcareous plankton, such as foraminifera or coccolithophores, express preferential uptake of O18 under cool conditions. Therefore, subjecting sedimentary deposits of these plankton to isotopic analysis allows us to establish the temperature of the water at the time of deposition. Species assemblages show variation in the number of warm and cold water plankton species depending on the water temperature. Furthermore, some species show morphological variations in response to the same climatic variables. The content of pterogeneous material in sediments corresponds to continental weathering. Consequently, the purity of the calcareous ooze gives a strong indication of the extent of weathering to which the continents were subjected, and therefore the intensity of the climatic processes. The physical and chemical processes affecting inorganic sediments before deposition also correspond to particular climate regimes, and are evidenced by the form of the inorganic sediments. There are many other sources of proxy data, but we will touch only on a few of them and very briefly. Glacial moraines give a rough picture of glacial advances and retreats, but successive movements frequently erase each other, and difficulties in dating moraines therefore mean that the application is somewhat limited. Lacustrine, or lake, size variation, especially in arid areas, can be significant. Stratigraphic and microfossil analysis can give some indication of climate variation. 
Pollen typically accumulates on all surfaces in the world and is useful for paleoclimatic deduction. However, the many difficulties associated with analysis mean that only qualitative comparisons are feasible. That is, we could say it's warmer and drier now than previously, but we can't say with any certainty how much warmer or drier. Sedimentary rocks can provide data through fasces analysis, that is, studying the different rocks types. As well as assessment of the fossils and microfossils, an analysis of sediment grain size and rate of deposition. However, the resolution of these data is very low, typically thousands of years. So, what is the role of climate models in all of this? Well, once historical and paleoclimatological data have been gathered, we have some idea of how the climate has changed in the past. And we also know what atmospheric and biological conditions were associated with this change. This allows us to build and test models of the interaction of climatic variables. These models allow us some capacity to then establish how a given change in certain factors will affect the future climate. And this becomes the basis for assessment of the current state of the environment. We will go into this in greater detail in Chapter 2. So what evidence is there for anthropogenic climate change? Well, by comparing current data and measurements with historical and paleoclimatological data, we have obtained a good picture of the climate over the last several thousand years. It is clear that there has been a significant transformation of the climate over the last hundred years, and that the rate of change is increasing. Signal analysis and modelling has proved that this change cannot be attributed to processes other than human interaction with the environment. The change in size of glaciers is measured by the mass balance, that is, the net annual gain or loss of mass at the glacier surface per unit surface area. This is a useful measure, because as well as monitoring glacier size, it measures the contribution of glacial melt to sea level rise. The World Glacier Monitoring Service has shown that almost all glaciers worldwide are retreating. A few of them have been observed to be advancing, especially in Norway and New Zealand, but this is because of increased precipitation due to warmer weather. The exposure of radiocarbon dated remains in high saddles in the Alps shows recession is reaching levels not seen for thousands of years. A good example of this is the 5,000 year old Ursel Iceman. The pictures on the left detail the retreat of a, the Grinnell Glacier over a 98 year period of Montana's Glacier National Park in the United States. Furthermore, by examining and dating the glacial moraines of various glaciers, a comprehensive picture of their movements can be obtained. In this case, the accelerating recession of the Gangotri Glacier. Furthermore, this final graph details the decreasing net balance for both 30 monitored glaciers and the means of glaciers in nine different regions monitored by the World Glacier Monitoring Service. Another indicator of increasing temperature is the retreat of sea ice. Comprehensive Antarctic sea ice records date from the 1970s, although there is considerable data prior to this point for the Arctic. A considerable decrease in sea ice thickness over the 1978 to 1996 period has been observed. Satellite data has shown a considerable decrease in the extent of sea ice. This is particularly evident in the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf in 2002, which lost 3,250 square kilometres. In total, the shelf has now lost 5,700 square kilometers and is 40% of its previous stable size. Four other major ice shelves have retreated. The total area of sea ice lost in Antarctica, barring that expected to carve under normal conditions, is over 13,500 square kilometers since 1974. Sea ice melt does not contribute to sea level rise since this is already in the ocean. However, it does have other effects such as reducing the salinity and albedo of polar regions that both accelerate global warming. Another indicator of increasing global temperatures is the permafrost. Permafrost is a term used to describe a condition whereby the water in the soil is frozen all year round. The depth of permafrost may differ, but it generally thaws up to a meter in depth in summer periods. About 25% of the Northern Hemisphere landmass is under permafrost, including much of Canada, China, Russia, and Alaska. Significant portions of this area are now undergoing melting as a result of raised temperatures. 
This has been seen through the sudden appearance of potholes of considerable size and the draining of many lakes as their frozen base is removed. In addition, direct measurement of the melting of permafrost has been gathered over the last 20 years in many regions of the world. Onset, magnitude and extent of the permafrost melting, however, varies from area to area. Sea level rise is of particular concern to low-lying countries, or those countries like Bangladesh that have broad, flat floodplains. The global sea level has, on average, risen by 15 centimetres over the last century. Whilst the melting of sea ice does not itself increase the level of the oceans, as the Arct Antarctic ice sheet retreats, it is increasing polar glaciers' access to the ocean. As their flow increases under gravity, they will likely contribute more to the rise in sea level. The extent and rate of this influx is a subject of much research. In addition to the increasing amount of water flowing into the oceans, the sea level is likely to rise due to thermal expansion. Simulations predict that ultimate levels could reach as much as an additional 2 meters at equilibrium. Sea temperatures have been gradually increasing worldwide, as shown in this graph from the UK Meteorological Office. In the 19th century, temperature measurements were somewhat inaccurate due to the leaky buckets in which deep water was gathered. However, a correction factor used in the calculation of these temperatures shows them to be relatively consistent in the extent of this error, which can hence be eliminated. The immediate effects of global sea temperature rise will include a change in the capacity of seawater to absorb carbon dioxide, reducing its effectiveness as a carbon sink. Longer term concerns of such a trend include the shutting down or movement of oceanic currents, such as the thermohaline conveyor belt, ironically reducing air temperature in polar areas which are currently warmed by the current. Places such as Britain, which is dependent on the Gulf Stream for its current climate, may drop in temperature by as much as 3 degrees, although this effect is very localized. More importantly, the deep saline currents provide many nutrients for surface ecosystems fed by plankton. A reduction in oceanic plankton will limit another important carbon sink, since many species use atmospheric carbon in the formation of their carbonate shells, and subsequently remove it from the climate when they die and sink to the ocean bottom. It may also cause a crash in oceanic biodiversity, since plankton are the ocean's main primary producers, and hence the bottom of the food chain. This clearly begs the question, is oceanic circulation currently changing? A good place to start is with ENSO, the El Niño Southern Oscillation, which is a current system that is the primary global mode of variation on the two to seven year time interval, and it is typified by a change in sea surface temperature anomaly. It is very strongly associated with extreme climate events. A multi-proxy reconstruction of ENSO suggests that recent extremes are outside the norms of historic conditions. The 1990s in particular show trends outside the norms of previous decades, including reduced variability, that is, more El Niño events with reduced occurrence of the corollary cool La Niña. Similar statistical anomalies have been observed in both the North Atlantic Oscillation and the North Pacific Oscillation. These anomalies may be part of a larger variation, or may just be part of the natural cycle. At this stage it is too early to determine for certain. The greenhouse effect has received a lot of press of late, but it's not something new on Earth, and nor in fact is it primarily anthropogenic in origin. To some extent, life on Earth is contingent on the greenhouse effect. Without it, the Earth's surface temperature would be considerably below the freezing point of water. Certain gases are opaque at infrared light frequencies. These include methane, water vapor, nitrous oxides, ozone, and most importantly, carbon dioxide. Some of the incoming shortwave solar radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and then re-emitted as long-wave infrared radiation. This then is absorbed by greenhouse gases, raising the atmospheric temperature. As the proportion of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increases, so does the potential for absorption of radiation, effectively raising the temperature above previous levels. This effect, and the dangers of increased carbon dioxide emissions, was outlined by Svante Arrhenius over a century ago. The effect of various factors on the climate are expressed as a forcing value, i.e. to what extent they force global warming. 
The graph on the right describes the effects of carbon dioxide in the last century. The forcing value is measured in watts per square meter, that is the increase in effective energy caused per square meter. Forcings will be discussed in more detail in the next chapter on GCMs, but for now it's important to understand that there are many sources of climatic forcing. Human activity has introduced significant radiative forcing to the atmosphere through a number of different factors, and it is these which we will touch upon in the next couple of slides. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and most particularly in the last century with the widespread use of the internal combustion engine, atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases have climbed massively. This graph details the increase in methane concentration in the atmosphere in the last thousand years, and it's clear that the concentration has increased particularly rapidly within the last 200. Methane is produced by domestic animals in large quantities, but it's also produced by all anaerobic decomposition, most notably in landfills, hydroelectric dams, and rice paddies. As shown in the table below, the forcing relative to 1765 is only 0.1 in 1900, but increased to 0.42 watts per square meter in 1990, a considerable increase in the rate of accumulation. Atmospheric nitrous oxide concentrations seem to follow a similar trend. Nitrous oxide is naturally produced by biological functions in the soil and in the oceans. Anthropogenic sources include industrial combustion, vehicle exhausts, biomass burning, and the use of chemical fertilizers. The forcing increase relative to 1765 for nitrous oxides shows a similar sort of accumulation, increasing from 0.07 watts per square meter in 1900 to 0.1 in 1990. Carbon dioxide is of particular importance when studying anthropogenic climate change. As can be seen in the graph, carbon dioxide levels were relatively stable over the last thousand years until the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Carbon dioxide is emitted by all combustion, particularly fossil fuels used for engine fuels and for energy generation. The burning of forests also emits carbon dioxide as well as reducing their capacity for carbon sequestration, thereby reducing the rate at which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere. At this stage, carbon dioxide is the largest anthropogenic contribution to climate forcing. The levels are in fact higher than at any time in the past 450,000 years. The rate of carbon dioxide accumulation was very low over the period from 1765 to 1900, but more than doubled in the next 60 years, and almost doubled again in the following 30, reaching a peak of 1.5 watts per square meter in 1990. There are a number of other greenhouse gases that we'll touch upon briefly. Ozone plays an important role in reducing shortwave radiation influx by absorbing primarily ultraviolet light in the upper atmosphere. It uses the energy to spontaneously break up and reform the O3 molecules. However, in the lower atmosphere, ozone acts as a pollutant and is a greenhouse gas. The catalytic action of nitrous oxides, halocarbons, and hydroxyl ions in the stratosphere catalytically destroys large quantities of ozone, thereby increasing the influx of solar radiation. Halocarbons, such as CFCs and HCFCs, apart from destroying ozone in the upper atmosphere, are very strong greenhouse gases, in most cases thousands of times stronger than carbon dioxide. Furthermore, they are highly stable, taking decades to centuries to break down. These gases are entirely manufactured. They are primarily used as propellants for deodorants and other spray cans, and in refrigeration and air conditioners. As such, their effect has only been observed in the last century, with the climatic forcing rising from nothing in 1900, to 0.202 watts per square meter in 1990. The use of halocarbons has been restricted by the Kyoto Protocol. Aerosols are small particles dispersed in the air and include dust, water, soot, sea crystals and many others. Aerosols typically generate a cooling effect in the atmosphere by either acting as seeds for cloud formation or by directly reflecting solar radiation although natural causes still generate significantly more aerosols than anthropogenic, there is some concern that the high levels of aerosol emission in the northern hemisphere might be masking the actual effects of climate change. 
This is particularly true where there's large amounts of burning, such as the east, or dirty power generation. The cooling effect of aerosols is a very short-term effect in comparison to other anthropogenic radiative forcings, and consequently climate change may paradoxically be accelerated to some extent by reduced aerosol emissions. Sulfates and nitrates act as aerosols in the atmosphere. Data gathered from the Greenland ice sheet shows a dramatic increase in non-sea nitrate and sulfate concentrations since 1900, due primarily to human activities. These compounds are released through combustion of fossil fuels and are primary components of acid rain. Ironically, these aerosols may be offsetting the global warming effects of carbon dioxide. The mean global temperature of the planet has risen considerably in the last century, estimated at about 0.6 degrees, with a standard error of about 0.2. The 1990s were the warmest decade ever recorded. Furthermore, proxy records indicate that temperatures have not reached current levels for at least the past thousand years. In fact, proxy records indicate that the last time global temperatures reached levels like the current conditions were at the peak of the last interglacial period, 124,000 years ago. Note that the proxy records for recent history corroborate instrumental temperature assessments. This indicates the accuracy of proxy interpretation methods. Have there been any concerted changes in precipitation? Well, globally, an increase in precipitation over land of approximately 2% has been observed over the last century. However, this effect is very localized, and such areas as the Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa have actually seen a decrease in rainfall. Precipitation over the ocean can only properly be estimated from satellite observations, and as such, full records have only been available since 1987. Current indications are that oceanic precipitation has increased as well, but it is too early to say with statistical certainty. There may be a trend towards more intense rainfall events. Whilst much of sub-Saharan Africa is getting less rain, it is also getting it in short bursts rather than spread evenly over a season. Where the climate is changing, you might expect to see more incidences of extreme weather. Tropical cyclones, for instance, are associated with high winds and extreme rainfall, and have become high-profile events of late. However, an analysis of moderate and strong cyclones, those with a pressure of less than 980 hectopascals, shows no statistically significant trend. A similar analysis of extratropical cyclones reveals a significant increase in the latter half of the 20th century. It is unclear at this juncture whether this is part of a multi-decadal variation or of a significant long-term trend. So what conclusions can we draw from all of this? The international scientific community is now in firm agreement that global climate change is an established fact. However, international political responses to this fact have been considerably less than spectacular at this juncture. To some extent, our understanding of future trends in the climate is dependent on the accuracy of the model we use to describe the processes, as will be laid out in the next chapter. However, given that climate change is inevitable, it is incumbent upon conservation planners to integrate the current extent of knowledge into their planning ventures wherever possible.